Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's edition of Dallas Social Distancing Toastmasters. We are once again on the web via Zoom because of the current pandemic <coughs> and the fact that it has not relaxed much. This meeting is being recorded for later viewing if you're interested in doing so. And also, I just need to let you know that it is being recorded. I think we've got all of our roles taken care of. I need to show you the agenda real quick, so let me do that. Sharing my screen now. If you were to go to the main Toastmasters page for us, DallasSocialToastmasters.com, click on the Members section. Down in the right-hand column under Club Flyers and Announcements, there's a link, and if you click on that and go to the agenda for 2020, 6 11, that will take you to that page which I am going to keep right up here uh, for my viewing and reference during the meeting. You can do the same. <clears throat> and let's see, stop share. Go back to here. And with that, I think I've covered all of the announcements that I need to do for this meeting. I will send you directly to our Toastmaster for the evening, Rob Giles. Thank you very much, Mark. We greatly appreciate it. One thing that I do want to remind people is if you can, go ahead and mute yourself. If you find yourself not muted, especially during prepared speeches, it's very important. Sometimes we take ourselves off mute and we don't, you know, we don't remember to put ourselves back on. So please do that. Keep an eye on that as you move along and as you talk and as you take you back off of talking. Our theme for the meeting is the doctor in. I don't know about everybody in the Zoom room today, if they are regular or are frequenters of doctors, or if it's just a yearly checkup, things like that. But I was recently made aware by a friend who had a relative who, who went to a doctor, an actual specialist. And this is during the pandemic. And they went and there wasn't a whole lot of, shall I say, uh, precautions taken. Not everybody in the, in the facility was wearing masks. There weren't gloves all the time, which is kind of an odd thing. And the doctor, from my knowledge, was in eyes, ears, nose, throat, you know, one of those doctors. So it was, was even a little bit more curious to me. So that made me think about things as far as doctor visits and how they've changed and what they might look like down the road. We've got a speech that's coming up soon that is related to how this pandemic is changing or possibly could change the future of, of something that we do. And this is really another case where we might think about this, and it may be for good, it may, may not be so great, but it's something to consider. It's something that's been going on for a while, really, and that's online doctor visits, virtual doctor visits. Uh, it's kind of doc in the box doctor visits even. And some of these things you don't even need insurance for. You can go, you can pay 40 or $50 for this. And for a lot of people that can come in handy. Now, it, it's good for a lot of things like colds and flus and, and things of that nature, something that isn't super serious, hopefully, but it's something that I found interesting and I thought, you know, even though it's gone on in the past, how might this affect us moving forward? And I thought about my own experiences. In the past, I, I've, got, I've got my primary care physician that I deal with, and actually I don't deal with them as much as I do one of the specialists that I deal with is a liver specialist. And the liver specialist, over the past, I would say four or five years, I've seen actually less of that doctor and more of the medical assistant or the nurse that comes in and, and actually does the appointment. So it, it, it made me think, you know, is the doctor in, you know, is, is the doctor somebody that is actually needed in this situation, at least for myself? 
for a monitoring, a maintenance type of situation. Now, I actually had a visit today with a doctor and I'll get to that in a moment, but let's go ahead and move on to our duty holders for the evening. Think about those things and, and I'm gonna ask some questions regarding uh, doctor visits and from everybody. I'm not gonna ask for specific answers necessarily, but I might. But let's go to their duty holders for the evening. And we're gonna start, we have some people that are doing double duty. Our first duty holder is actually gonna be our timer and our posture monitor. And that is Tanya Howard. Tanya, can you tell us about your two duties tonight? Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. As a posture monitor, I will be looking to call attention to distracting gestures that a speaker may unconsciously use. These would include clasp hands in the front or behind your body, touching your hair, hands on your hips or in your pockets or repetitive gestures that may be distracting. And I will take note of those. And at the end of the meeting, I will um, give a report. And then as the timer for the evening, I will be helping the speakers to practice expressing a thought within a specific time. And my duty is to, to, is to time prepared speeches, table topics, and the speech evaluations. And the green card is that you're qualifying. The yellow card, or tonight orange, <laughs> is your target time and the red card is your maximum time and that you have 30 seconds to finish up. So um, for example, in a five to seven minute speech, the green card is at the five minutes, the yellow card is at six and the red card is at seven with 30 minutes to qualify. And then uh, throughout the evening, I will report qualifying times. If you um, go over your time or if you don't um, speak long enough within 30 seconds, then you do not qualify at the end of the meeting for awards. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you very much, Tanya. Uh, just to be sure that you know, although it says on the agenda five to seven minutes for Mark, and you may have noticed, noted this and I was looking at something else, but Mark is four to six minutes for his speech. So I apologize if I missed that. So before we go on to our next duty holder, one of the things that I've noticed and I've actually been using more is not necessarily a doctor visit, but an online method and actually an application for monitoring my own appointments and results from tests and things like that, which is a unique thing and something that I find very interesting and very helpful. So that's another thing that we may get a little bit more of coming down the road. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to our next duty holder. And that is John Vessels. He's actually doing double duty as well tonight. He's our accounter and our grammarian. John, can you tell us about your two duties tonight, please? Well, fellow Toastmasters and guests, I am John Vessels, and I'm going to be your grammarian for this evening. And the grammarian's job is to listen to the speakers and to watch for good uses of the English language or bad uses of the English language. And I will present a report at the end of the meeting on that usage. Also, I'm presenting the word of the day, which today the word of the day is advocate. Advocate means to plead for. I advocate the use of online telemedicine. There we go. <laughs> okay, so that's my job as a grammarian. My job as a counter is to listen to the speakers again, since I'm listening already, and listen for use of crutch words like uh, ums, so's, that we use too much as occasional so's okay, but when it's every other word, that's good, not a good thing. Too many ands, and you do this, and you do that, and then, and, and, and it's like, uh, -uh that's not good. So anyway, I will use this for crutch words, our long pauses where I can tell that somebody's lost their train of thought, they just don't know where they're going anymore. And I will give a report on those at the end of the meeting also when called upon by the general evaluator, Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you very much, John. 
Our last duty holder is our vote counter, a member that just recently came back to our club and we are happy to have her back, Karen Lee. Karen, can you please tell us about your duty as vote counter tonight? Hi, thank you, Chris Master. I will keep count of the votes tonight. You'll be asked to vote for the best speaker and you'll be also asked to vote for the best table topics and the best of the evaluators. And you'll send your votes to me and I will keep count and I will give a report at the end of the meeting or when called upon by the Toastmaster. Thank you very much, Karen. There's also the best of the big three. That's that last one that sometimes gets us, that we forget about a little bit, but uh, we eventually get around to it. Thank you very much, Karen. Appreciate it. As far as placing votes for those things, uh, send chats individually to, to Karen. So that's very important. Uh, not, don't send it out to everybody, just send it to Karen. Okay. All right, at this point, I, I do want to kind of backtrack just a tad, and that's to welcome a guest that we have here tonight, and that would be Brett Brown. Brett, thank you very much for joining us. If everybody give you a, a wave of applause here, we appreciate you being here and uh, we'll check in with you at the end of the meeting to see what you thought of everything and, and ask you a couple of questions. So yeah, just a quick, <laughs> just a quick one for me since I spoke with Brett yesterday. Uh, Brett actually has, uh, was interested in joining us because he has done speech competitions during school and he's found, he just finds it very interesting and enjoyable to do it and uh, stimulating. So he thought this would be an interesting venue to at least investigate. Very good, very good. Excellent, great, great background, background there. Thank you very much, Mark. And thank you, Brett. So before we get into the prepared speeches, as I was mentioning, there's an app. I specifically frequent uh, Baylor Scott White Hospital. And so there's the, uh, I think it's my BSW app. And I get to go in there, I can check all of my blood work level numbers from going back years and years and compare them if I need to compare them myself. And I'm kind of a statistical kind of person. So I'm interested in knowing what's going on with each of my numbers as I go along. And I can actually pose questions to the doctor on that app, which I haven't, I didn't do for a long time, but recently, uh, even before the pandemic, I started to use that app as an avenue to get either detailed questions or some things that I may have missed during my, my physical appointment in person. So the transition is really, it's, it's ready and it's there. I can ask a question. It may not be my doctor that answers through a, through a messaging portion of that app. It may be the nurse that answers. It may be one of the medical assistants that answer but I get the information back to me and I can go back and forth with them if I'm not understanding something and there's no cost. That's all part of the deal. So it's, it's, it's a great way as opposed to having to go back in and ask tons of questions or trying to call. A lot of times in the past, you may, I know that I've had problems, you know, going back 10, 15 years where you try to call, you call, you can't get a hold of the doctor. You got to wait for the doctor. And then the doctor calls you back. What if you're not available at that time? So there's a lot more, back and forth, it takes a long period of time. Whereas this type of interaction, the online interaction can, can help in that regard as well. At this point, I do wanna pose one question. Uh, has, has anybody here done an online doctor visit, a virtual doctor visit? Okay, all right. And of all of you, was it, was it cam to cam? Yes, yeah, okay. All right, so not just, not just verbal, not just you know, on there, but no, no video. So it's, it seems a little, it probably seems a little ridiculous, I would imagine maybe the first time you do it is a little ridiculous or feels that way because you say, Does that, is this really even needed? Can you do this right on the phone? You know, is this something that, because for the most part from what I always gather is that you're, it's a Q and A. You're asking a question, the doctor's asking a question, doctor asks a question, you answer it, and it goes back and forth, and then they say, all right, well, this is what I think, which is what you get when you're at the appointment, right? But 
does it do you need to be face to face? That's what I often say with some of the conference calls that my workplace has as well. Do we really need to have a video conference call for this? Can we just do a phone conference call? But that being said, it's something that I think maybe a little bit more of the face of the future for the medical community. And it could be very beneficial to a lot of us in many, many different ways, as I've mentioned. At this point, we're gonna move into our prepared speeches. And the first prepared speech is Dawn Levy's speech. And she is going to be evaluated by Mr. Lee King. Lee, can you tell us a little bit about Dawn's speech tonight? Yes, Dawn is giving us a five to seven minute speech that she has prepared and delivered before. And her objective is to go back and make changes based on the recommendations of her evaluators and represent the speech. So that's actually what she is doing this evening. And her time is five to seven minutes. Wonderful, thank you very much, Lee. So at this point, I would like to introduce Don Levy with how might COVID-19 change education? How might COVID-19 change education? Don Levy. As a reminder to our speakers, please make sure that you have Tanya Howard, your timer visible on your screen. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. Good evening, fellow Toastmasters and guests. As Lee said, tonight I am representing a speech that I gave in early May titled, How Might COVID-19 Change Education? So as you know, before summer vacation even started, school buildings were closed this year. It's estimated that around 50 million children in America were not actually in school through, from mid-March through May when they should have been in school learning. So my question is, what in the world is going to happen? It's scary to think about. I spent a lot of time since mid-March reading about what has been happening in education since schools closed in 47 states and Washington, D.C., when they closed their school buildings through the end of the school year. It should go without saying that American schools were not prepared to go to online learning, because why would they be? Were teachers ready to pivot to do all their teaching without students in their classroom? Of course not. Do all children have access to computers at home? Absolutely not. Do all students have access to reliable internet? No way. And do all students have parents who can help them with their schoolwork at home? No, they don't. So as you can imagine, the already wide equity gap is only getting wider, and we as a nation face incredible challenges in education going forward. Tonight, I'm going to share with you some of the main concerns coming out of this pandemic crisis in the education space. So it's hard to boil down to just a few concerns, but I'd like to share with you my thoughts on the following three concerns. So first of all, what exactly are students missing by not being in school? And two, what, what are students possibly facing at home because they're not in school? And then third thing is how, how in the world will school resume? So first I'd like to just give you a few seconds to think about what you would have missed as a child if you were cruising along in school, having a pretty decent year, and then all of a sudden there's a big stop sign in front of your face and you have to stay at home. You don't even know how long you're going to be at home. What would you have missed? So you can just think about that for a second. Okay, so, so from what I've been thinking about and reading about, what exactly are students missing? Well, first and foremost, I think they're missing their friends. They're missing their teachers. They're missing their routine. And some of the little ones are probably missing their little desks, their little lunch boxes, going to the library, going to recess. But what are they truly missing, like big picture? Of course, they're missing learning. They're missing being introduced to new concepts. They're, being, they're missing practicing and mastering old material and new material. I've read that if, if they didn't, ha that there's a prediction that if, if students didn't get study instruction mid-March through May, that they, some of them might only retain 50 to 70 percent of what they learned this year. So as you can imagine, there will be a domino effect for all the subsequent years. 
Kids also were missing meal time and they were missing meals. The first week that schools were closed in Dallas ISD, over 320,000 meals were given out. Kids also met, missed their mental health services. They missed the school nurse. They missed in-person speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy. So what did kids miss? They missed a ton. School is a primary lifeline for millions and millions of children. So since they weren't in school, they were essentially stuck at home, what were they facing? So they were facing, a lot of them were facing unbelievable stress, the stress that they saw their parents or their older siblings or anybody around facing. There was a big spike, the price still is, I haven't, I haven't looked because it's terrifying, um, in domestic and child abuse cases. The financial stress on millions, literally over 40 million who've lost their jobs, it has got to be just absolutely unreal. Not having money for um, food, for groceries, for new clothes, all, rent, all of it. You can't hide that kind of stress from kids. They know, they, they, they can feel it when the house is tense and people are nervous and they know when things aren't right. The kids are scared, we're all scared. So not being in school allowed even more time for exposure for, for what, what to be scared of. And this, this leads me to the million dollar question, the one that I think is, is the hardest to fathom, is how will school resume? So in Dallas at this time, there are just projections and considerations for, for how we'll resume. Dr. Hinojosa, the superintendent of Dallas schools, announced earlier there are three possible scenarios, kind of, kind of clear what and obvious what they'd be. Go back to school, continue with at-home learning, or a combination of both. So aside from all the logistics that have to be considered that we can all thank heavens that we don't have to come up with these um, massive decisions, like how many kids can be in a classroom at a time? How many kids can be on a bus at, at one time? What are they gonna do about masks and gloves and sanitizer? What's gonna happen if, if they decide, okay, it's safe, everybody can go back to school on a staggered schedule or whatever it might be, and then, everything shuts down again, we pivot and have to go back to online learning, you know, within a matter of days. And what, what will the beginning of school actually look like? You can't really just pick up where we left off in mid-March, right after spring break. Say you were in third grade then, and now you're supposed to be in fourth grade. Really, will kids be ready for fourth grade? I'm thinking a lot of them will not, and a lot of them will have been at home for what, six or seven months, so that their behavior will be off too. So there'll have to be a lot of review. Um, there, some kids will probably repeat a year. Some, there's been some discussion on teachers looping. So the kids, the teachers of those third grade kids might move up to fourth grade with the same group of kids. So they already know the kids and know their families. One of my biggest fears in all this is that teachers won't want to teach, that the teachers won't want to return to the classroom. Principals won't want to return to the classroom. I've read a lot about that, but I don't, really have time to get into that now. So let me just say, I hope that this speech has given you some food for thought. Real quick, the questions or concerns I went over or what exactly are students missing by not being in school? What are students possibly facing at home because they were not in school? And how in the world will school resume? Back to you, Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you very much, Don. Great, great questions for, think about. if not all of us directly, for our, our society, for sure. Absolutely, challenges that are coming for us, and they're coming probably sooner than we think. So let's move into the second speech for the evening. Our second speaker is Mark Sims, and his evaluator for the evening <laughs> is going to be Indu Pathanathan. And I probably didn't get that right, but I apologize in there. <laughs> so at this point, I would like to ask you, Indu, could you please tell us about Mark's speech? Good evening, everybody. Mark is attempting to deliver social speeches. The purpose of this project is for Mark to practice delivering social speeches in front of club members. Amma, please note, his speech is from four to six minutes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Hindu. Please help me to welcome Mark Sims with Uncle Jerry. Uncle Jerry, Mark Sims. 
Jerry Hale was my mother's younger brother. He and his wife, Doris, were very close to our family. When I and my brother were growing up, we would spend some of, the, of the, our summers at their home in Sherman. And Jerry and Doris would come to our home in Arlington and spend time, maybe take us to Six Flags or take us to ball games. And as like I say, we were close. We had a lot of good times together. And Jerry passed away in November 2016. And these are a few of the remarks I had at his funeral then, and then some additional thoughts since that time. Jerry was born in 1935, and he had the ultimate simple and consistent lifestyle. He lived his entire life in Sherman, Texas, and he didn't want to live anywhere else. And he did not much like being away from Sherman too many days. On a vacation, he would get antsy and want to go back home pretty soon. He worked, I believe, except for a short stint in the Army, worked almost exclusively for his father for all of his work career at a horse and cattle trailer manufacturing plant that my grandfather, his father, owned. Jerry went to the same church for, I think, over 50 years. And that was located across the street from the house where him and Doris lived in for roughly the last 50 years of their life. He was married to the same woman for just a little over 60 years, and she passed away just a couple of weeks before he did. So he was the ultimate routine guy, the ultimate steady Eddie, you, you might call him. Now, several characteristics to find Jerry. He was a worker. I noted that he worked for his father, but that did not mean he got one of those stereotypical cushy jobs when you're one of the relatives in the company business because he had to work out in the manufacturing plant. And I helped him on a few occasions growing up, and it was tough work, long hours, physical labor, it was dirty, and it was loud. And he would come home in the evenings, again, filthy, and the accumulation of noise over the years caused him to go pretty much death uh, later in life. Now, I heard him at times express his misgivings about that. He would have liked to have had an easier way to make a living, but with his educational level and his skill sets, that really wasn't practical. So he knew he had a pretty tough deal to make a living, but he persevered. Jerry was also frugal. Frugal's a nice word. He was cheap. He was a tight wide. Now, fortunately, he and his wife Doris were very much aligned on their spending habits. They were both frugal because otherwise, if she had been a big spender, they probably would have killed each other. But from looking at, from the residences they live in, from the furnishings, from lifestyles, again, it was just their nature to save money, which they did very well. Fortunately, they did take a few nice vacations, including one trip of a lifetime vacation to California in the mid-70s. And then oddly enough, less than a year before Jerry passed away, he bought a new car. He didn't have the finance. He just paid for it. And he was so proud of that, even though he did not even need to be driving at that time. That was an uncharacteristic um, splurge on his part. Jerry was a moral and upright person. He did not just talk about his Christian faith, but he lived it. Now, his younger brother and sister, uh, and not my mother, uh, but his uh, other uh, sister, had some personal and professional scandals in their life, but not Jerry. I have heard that a couple of his brothers-in-law, who were a little mischievous, did on at least one occasion get him to take a drink. But again, that was very much out of character. Jerry enjoyed the company of children. 
for whatever the reasons, and I was too young to really get the scoop on this, he and his wife did not have children of their own. So his nieces and nephews, in a sense, were surrogates. And he enjoyed throwing a baseball with them, pushing them on a swing, just spending time with them. And he was actually laid back enough that he was easier for my brother and I to talk to in some ways than our father. So he definitely enjoyed the presence of his nieces and nephews. We all have faults and Jerry had a couple of issues to deal with. He could be jealous of how he was treated compared to his other brother, some sibling rivalries. I've heard him make remarks in, to that extent. And also he nursed some resentments because he was not an assertive person, so could get taken advantage of in some cases. I recall in the job that he had, sometimes or when I would work with him, he would leave for lunch earlier than the other guys, but he would collect their money, pick up food orders, take it back, and he got roped into doing that, and he simply didn't have the assertiveness to tell them to make their own arrangements. But to sum up, Jerry was a good and decent man, a man of character, again, a frugal person with a simple lifestyle, and he remains a special memory for our family, Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you very much, Mark. We definitely learned a lot about Uncle Jerry, and <laughs> you did a great job with that. Thank you. At this point, I would like to ask our timer, Madam Timer, did both of our speakers qualify on time? Yes, both qualified. Don qualified with six minutes and 54 seconds, and Mark qualified with six minutes and 27 seconds. Cool. Three minutes, three seconds to spare. Oh, wow. <laughs> nice. That's... That's some good timing there, good timing. <laughs> okay, so at this point, we're gonna play, go for a vote for either Mark Sims or Don Levy. What you wanna do is send a private message to Karen Lee, pull up your, your chat, send that private message to Karen Lee to say who you feel did the better job this evening. Again, either Don Levy or Mark Sims. And we'll get back to Karen's tally at the end of the meeting. I want to pose another question to everybody. I had mentioned that for myself over the past five years or so, when I went in to see my doctor, I didn't actually end up seeing my doctor. So if, with a show of hands, how many of you have experienced that on, on, I would say, more than just one occasion, if it's a frequent thing for you? And to follow that up, of those of the two, Marcia and Mark, did you find that to be uncomfortable? Was it something that was eh, not a big deal? Was it was it uncomfortable for you? Yes, no, yes. Yeah, yeah. And it can be, especially if you're not ready for that, or if you feel like you don't have a choice in the matter, like, all right, this is it, otherwise I have to wait another three months. Uh, for me, it became a little bit old hat. So it, it became easier. But at the beginning, definitely, I had the same feelings that you had, Marsha, no, no doubt. And I was like, is this person qualified to take care of me the way I need to be taken care of? So definitely some questions about that. But that, in some ways, that leans to the, the question of online, being an online doctor, so to speak. Does that take anything away from the accuracy, from, or at least the feeling of contentment and of being taken care of. So that's something that I think that we all probably are gonna have to consider. Uh, although I think in the future, sooner than later, as things transition, and I think things similar to the education questions that Dawn brought up, how is the medical industry gonna be looked at and, and will this become more prevalent sooner than later? Will it be something that's just a total benefit for everybody, or will there be some some downsides to it? Um, now, probably there's going to be both, but I guess it's probably going to be probably on an individual basis, which probably isn't a whole lot different than it is now when you meet a real person face to face. So, at this point, we're going to move into the second portion of our meeting, which is table topics. We have a first time topic master, so. Please give a warm welcome 
to Mr. Nicholas Elwood. Nicholas, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Toastmaster. Fellow Toastmasters and, and welcome Brett as a guest. For table topics, this enables a member to really develop the skills of impromptu speaking. Table topics helps train members to quickly organize and express their thoughts. You can think of the table topic speech as a mini speech with an opening, a body, and a conclusion. This also provides a speaking opportunity for any member who is not on duty in the meeting agenda. Sorry for tonight, there may be, <laughs> there may be some confliction with that, but we'll, 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 we'll roll with the punches here. Guests will also participate if they want to. Each speaker is required to speak for one to two minutes. Participants are disqualified at two minutes and 30 seconds. And each speaker must use the word of the day in the speech. And today's word is, I'm actually not sure. Jo Hold on one second. John, what was the word of the day? Advocate. Advocate. Oh, advocate. Advocate, yeah. Got it, thank you. Today's word is advocate. So, without further ado, let's get started with our topic today is the doctor in. So I personally really like how organized doctor's offices are from, you know, the, the posh hallways and the really easy check-in and check-out, especially the candy. I used to love that as a kid, I remember. <laughs> you know, really the most important, important part for me going to the doctor's office is actually figuring out what I'm sick with. The first question is actually going to be for Mark Schroeder. And Mark, what do you think is the most important thing about going to the doctor's office and why? Thank you, Nicholas. That's an interesting question. The most important <laughs> thing about going to a doctor's office and why? For me, the most important thing is it's, it's always got to be getting the right diagnosis because there are, there are doctors that are really good at, di at their diagnostic skills and there are doctors that are not. I've been to doctors where it has been a PA primarily that was doing the exams. I've got one other doctor. There is no PA at her office. If you go to her office, you get the full hour of time with her which is absolutely wonderful. She does all the questions, she writes all of it down, and then she follows it all up. And you really feel like she spends the time with you. And it, in fact, it's one of the things that I really love about that doctor more than anything else. She will get to the bottom of anything. If she doesn't know what the answer is, she will not give up. I've had so many other doctors that, well, I don't know what this is, or maybe we can try that, but they're all practicing medicine because they don't really know what medicine really is for sure. And so occasionally it's a matter of, are you watching for the right symptoms? Are you telling them about the right symptoms? Because I always look at my job when I go in as, what do I need to tell you in order to be able to help me? So I, I will ask questions of what else should I be looking for if we don't have an answer for what's going on? And, and, and questions of that nature. Because for me, the diagnosis is the most important. I've had some doctors that have had the worst the worst bedtime or bedside manner. Uh, one of them actually was an ear, nose, and throat. And the first thing he says is, mouth is an incredibly dirty place. You'd be better off have, going and kissing your dog. Your dog's mouth is cleaner than your own mouth. And it's like, yeah, okay. He's got a really awful manner, but he was a really good doctor and really good at diagnosing what the problem was and prescribing the right medications for it. So for me, it's getting the diagnosis right and getting me relief that will work and if possible suggestions so that I don't end up back there again which is one of the reasons that I go to an osteopath rather than an MD for a lot of my things. Back to you. Thank you Mark. I, I did really enjoy that that part where you mentioned um, just the you know the, the doctors that are just really almost malpractice in, in their in their approach with with clients and, and their patients. Never a good thing. <laughs> For my second question, really all of these 
different features at the doctor's office can be a great tool for our own advancement and knowledge, but sometimes it can be really a lot to handle. I really like kind of brushing up a little bit and, and reading about medicine practice and, and just doctors in general, and just to learn a little bit more on, on my own time. This, this question will be for John Vessels. If you have any questions or anything, or if you want me to repeat it, just let me know. John, ha have you ever done some at-home studying or looking up stuff about medicines or doctors in your spare time? If, if, if so, why? If not, why not? To you, John. Well, thank you. No. <laughs> thank you, Nicholas. Well, yeah, I do that all the time. I don't know, you, you may not know it, but I used to be a paramedic back in the 80s and 90s, and I've worked in healthcare so for going on 30 years. And so I am definitely a medical person. I'm also just in general, a curious person and a pseudo intellectual. I like to read about things and check things out. So yeah, I read up on everything. I'll read up on what I think it is, and then I go to the doctor and I tell him, da, 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 and he goes, well, no, it's not that, it's this, John. Okay, fine, you know, whatever, and I'll go home and read that. <laughs> also, I look up all my medications and stuff. I don't read in great detail on those, though, because I'm an advocate, just take the medicine and shut up. I look at nothing because I'm also a bit of a hypochondriac and get me starting to read stuff and I get a little paranoid about it. It's like, wait a minute, there's, you have to take this with a grain of salt. They talk about there's a possibility that you will have a heart attack taking Limboza, you know, some drug. Yeah, one person in 48,000 people took it, but the pharmacist has to list that on the warnings because it occurred once. So you read all this kind of stuff, it's like, ignore all that. Don't read all that kind of stuff, because it's like, wait a minute, am I nauseous? This is my left side wig? Crap, what's wrong with me? I said, drug, get over it. So yeah, I do a lot of research, but that's just because I'm a curious person. And I like to research a lot of different types of things. <laughs> so there you go, Mr. Nicholas. Thank you, John. That, that's awesome. I, I didn't know that you've been in, in, in the field of, of doctor and medicine, you know, and, and healthcare industry for, for so long. That's really cool. So for my third question, getting to the good stuff here, <laughs> you know, the, everyone can agree these days have been really difficult for all of us since we're all itching to be talking face to face amongst one another. We're constantly getting and we're constantly getting meeting reminders on the websites and WhatsApp for virtual Zoom meetings, either for business or for doctor's appointments or for us at Dallas Social Toastmasters. This question will be for Marsha. Marsha, are you for or against meeting your doctor face-to-face -face again now? If so or not, why? Thank you, Nicholas. Can you clarify, am I against meeting my doctor face-to-face? -face? Yes, so, so the, uh, let, me, let me repeat the question. It's mm -hmm. it maybe a little tricky. So just, are you for or against, at, at this exact moment, meeting your doctor face-to-face? -face? Would you rather be meeting him virtually right now or, or meeting him face-to-face? -face? Sometimes it's different for, for, for people, so. Okay, gotcha, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I would be against meeting my doctor virtually. It's important to me to um, speak to them face to face. And um, at the onset of the whole pandemic, I did have to go in um, to see my doctor and I felt better. Um, he took the time to uh, speak to me, you know, give me the opportunity about the precautions, um, all of that. And I respected that a great deal. Mm -hmm. However, my husband, he is a veteran. And so the VA is totally shut down, supposedly. And so he has had several tele 
I don't know what you want to call them, pseudo appointments, I'd say, um, with his doctors. And it was, it was challenging. It was very, very challenging. And I found myself having to advocate for him for the simple fact is that they sought to not um, carry on with certain requests or certain um, tests and they were falling on with the whole COVID-19. And so just a matter of fact, as a Monday, he had an appointment and I had to, you know, assert myself or better yet advocate for him to say that, you know, I understand the fact that we're in COVID-19 and the concern about transmission. And he does fall in that category of being high risk. However, we have to understand that with those individuals who have pre-existing conditions, they, they existed before COVID-19. And so whereas the need for medical care and to address those pre-existing conditions, they need to be met. Uh, and so, um, no, for myself, no. Face-to-face -face is all the way for me. Thank you. Yeah, that was excellent, Mar Marsha. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. They make a really good point about really just having the doctor there and being able to speak to you face to face and giving you the right treatment. I, I, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. for, for our last question tonight, Dallas social Toastmasters, our, our club is a lot like the doctor's office for members or patients in this case to socialize and to bounce ideas off of. I think that's a really great part of being at the doctor's office is getting just meet new people. And the same thing with, with our Toastmasters club, this question is going to be for our wonderful guest tonight, Brett, Brett, what do you really like about visiting the doctor's office and why? Well, thank you, Nicholas. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, my favorite thing about visiting the doctor's office is the experience and the feeling that I get when I've left. When you go into the doctor, you have worries, you might have doubt, or you might have a reason that you're coming for that needs a solution. When you go into the doctor's office, you have someone that takes care of you. Someone that gives you, hopefully, all the information you need to feel good about what you need to do moving forward. And once you've left, you feel clarity. You feel that ease of stress that you had, even maybe 30 or 45 minutes ago. And as we're not having to go into the doctor's office, you know, so many people are to the point of this meeting today, having the chance to not go in there, that experience is being missed. And I think that that feeling and that ease of people's pain um, is something that is very difficult to do uh, through this screen. And even to your point earlier as addressing this question, it's, you know, even for the people here in this meeting today, just simply coming here and meeting with other people and talking is part of the therapy and part of the healing that comes from going to the doctor um, and going to a meeting like this. So in my opinion, my favorite part about going to the doctor is the feeling after I've left. Thank you. Great job, Brett. Thank you. I, I agree. I think the social therapy of it, of it all, especially during this trying and tumultuous time is super important. So thank you. All right. So that, that does it for the questions tonight. And M Madam Timer, did all of our participants qualify on time? Yes, everyone qualified on time. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. And then Mr. Grammarian, John, did all of our speakers use the word of the day, advocate? No. Nope. Marcia did. I did. I didn't hear Mark Schroeder unless I missed it. You did not. And I didn't think so. And Brett did not use it either. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yep. Now, just take take the time to vote for your favorite table topic speaker. It's going to be really tough. All of you all were, were really, really good. So um, just send that to our vote counter, which is Karen tonight. And just you know, whoever you thought was the best, just, just send it to her and then she will take a tally and for the end of the meeting. So now I'm actually going to hand it off to our general evaluator, Mr. General Evaluator. Thank you so much, Nicholas. 
At this point, we will begin the general evaluation portion of the meeting. Uh, my name is Mark Schroeder, and I will be leading it. We are going tonight to start off with the GE in 3D. So, mm, mm. okay, now that we've done that, <laughs> what I want to do, we have uh, several things we have to do for this section of the meeting. We're going to have a, a, a report, an evaluation report from each of our two speakers, evaluators tonight. We will go through the duty holders reports to see how we did in general on our duties. And I will do an evaluation of the meeting as a whole, how I thought we did. And so we will go ahead and get right into it, starting with Lee King is going to be the evaluator for Don Levy's speech. Lee, are you ready to go? Lee is on mute. Now I am. Oh, there you are. All right. <laughs> Try to turn off the mute and turn off the camera instead. So. Okay. Good evening, fellow Toastmasters, guests, and especially Don. It's been a great opportunity to evaluate your speech for this evening. I really felt that you gave a very good speech. I think that definitely having a speech that is oriented in our current situation and provides various viewpoints is very important. Thank you for sharing a, a speech on how you feel COVID-19 has affected education. Your speech was very well organized. I felt like you were more prepared this time. And you also, I believe used more gestures this time that throughout your speech that you did not use the last time. So you've definitely improved your speech between the last time you gave this presentation and this time, which was your main objective. So you definitely met your objective. One thing that I would suggest that you might want to consider in future speeches is if you're going to give facts, Tell us where it came from, because you gave us several statistics throughout the speech. And I would be interested in knowing where you found that. So for example, the, the percentage of people, the children that will not retain information from March until when they return to school, and things such as that. Giving us just a little bit of information on where you found that. Where, where did you read that? would be very interesting just because then that way we can, we can go back and look at that article as well if we're interested. Um, but also it gives a little more credibility to your speech as opposed to just saying, well, I read this and I read that. Giving a more specific type of source is, is definitely, will make your speech sound more professional. But the one thing that I thought that you did really well and the one area that I really felt like you excelled at in this speech was the use of the gestures throughout the speech. And I definitely felt like you were more comfortable on camera compared to your previous speech. So thank you for sharing and I look forward to hearing other speeches of yours. Back to you, Mr. General Evaluator. Thank you, Lee. Our second speaker this evening was Mark Sims. Mark Sims, evaluator for this evening is Indu Patmanathan. Indu, would you please give your evaluation of Mark Sims' speech? Thank you, Mark. Good evening, everybody, uh, and good evening, speaker. Uh, Mark, thank you for that heartfelt eulogy uh, for Uncle Jerry. You, you made me feel like, like I knew Uncle Jerry uh, personally. You started with points like, like all the way from the time that he was born. Um, you spoke about um, how he didn't like to stay away from his hometown for more than a few days. And it was details like that, that actually made, that brought us one step closer to Uncle Jerry. And uh, you spoke about his wife, and you shared how they both were like two halves of one, um, how they were alike, and um, how that really um, enriched his life. 
you used uh, some very good adjectives to describe Uncle Jerry, like um, like how he he was he, he persevered and um, he was frugal, and you used the terms uncharacteristic, uncharacteristic splurge, etc. And this was the other type of um, information that brought him one more step closer to Uncle Jerry. A uh, few things that I would like to advocate um, is that I felt your voice was um, a very constant, you know, um, you could have just used slight voice modulations, um, like, for example, uh, to say he loved, you know, spending time with his nieces and nephews. And I feel that voice modulation actually helps audience feel emotions. So that's one place where I thought you could um, improve. And also, uh, I liked how you summarized in the end, but I felt that the summary was a little rushed because I think you noticed the, that you were running out of time. So just for future reference, just like make sure you uh, identify where to start concluding or start summarizing your speech. And um, other than that, I, I really, really enjoyed um, listening and learning more about Uncle Jerry. And I, I, was, I was happy that you said some positives as well as, as, as well as some offsides of Uncle Jerry, which gave us an insight into Uncle Jerry as a whole uh, person. And uh, once again, thank you so much. And I think um, your objective of delivering um, a speech, a social speech, I think you did a really good job. Thank you. All right, thank you, Indu. My next duty is to ask for a timers report. Tanya, how did both of our evaluators do on their time this evening? Both of the evaluators met their expectations. Excellent, that means both evaluators are eligible for votes. Our vote counter, of course, is still Karen Lee, but if you would, please private message Karen Lee, which is K A R N Lee at gmail.com with a vote for one of our two evaluators, either either Indu or Lee King. I'll give everybody just a moment to do that. In the meantime, so I have actually had to deal with the issue of uh, getting a PA versus getting a doctor. When I've gone to an office and gotten a PA, if it was for Oh, let's say a physical. I don't feel bad about that at all. I didn't even feel bad about it when it was for an orthopedic surgeon where the procedure had already been performed and they were just making sure everything was all right. When I was going into the neurosurgeon, on the other hand, and I got a PA, I was kind of thinking, am I getting a discount on this appointment? Because I'm not sure I'm getting <laughs> the full service. But for the most part, it still did work out all right. Uh, I will give you a warning. If you do have to do a virtual appointment, which I did because I was having a sore throat and was in fact worried whether or not I had COVID-19, uh, one of the things that I learned is yes, they can get a camera or use your camera on your device like a tablet or a phone. It would be a good thing to remember to have a flashlight near you because they needed a, having a flashlight nearby made a very big difference on what they could see in my throat to determine that it was probably not the not something really, really severe, that it would all take care of itself over time. Mine or might not have been strep, probably wasn't even that. And so just keep in mind that if you, if you do call and expect to do one of those, have a lot of stuff ready, whether it's a uh, flashlight, if you can take your temperature, do so. If you have a way of taking your blood pressure or any other, other vitals, please have that ready for them because it'll save them a lot of time and get you a better answer. Again, diagnosis is always important, the most important thing. All right, at this point, with the general evaluator, most of those duties out of the way, I wanna talk about, or rather go check on some of our other duty holders for tonight. Tanya, you were a posture monitor as well, correct? If you would, please tell us what we did for posture tonight. Yes, sir. We, um, everyone did a great job with their posture. I didn't see anything that was distracting this evening. Thank you. Great, thank you. John Vessels, you are both Ockhounder and Grammarian. Please give us the reports for the both of those. 
All right. Let's start with Alcantar. Rob, you were sewing earlier on in the evening at the very beginning. We had like about three in a row when we were starting up. Tanya heard an uh out of you when you were explaining what your duty was as a as, uh, timer. Uh, I'm doing it now. Uh, I got two now. Let's go for three. Don, two ums. Nicholas, two uhs. Brett, you had an um and then two uhs on your table topics. And that's about it. Everybody else did a really good job. Now for grammarian, I had a lot of good little words and phrases I pulled out tonight, but my absolute favorite is steady Eddie. I think that's just great. I like that. I have to use that. Uh, Don had fathom. Mark, you did persevere. Frugal, trip of a lifetime. And for those that don't know, PA is a physician assistant as opposed to an NP, which is a nurse practitioner. But they both can do the same job. Uh, Marsha, my other favorite one tonight. And this is going to, this has to be a new coined word for COVID 19 in 2020 pseudo appointment. Because that's how I feel some of my tele appointments have been. It's like, oh, really? I just paid my specialist 50 dollars for this are you kidding but that's another great one and nicholas i had to I tried to catch you on this but it's actually a correct word and it's confliction i didn't confliction just didn't sound right to me but i looked it up and oh sure enough confliction's a word so you got it <laughs> thank you back to you mark thank you so much john all right with that i'm going to go ahead and do a meeting evaluation as a whole. We did start late. That is something that was done consciously and with announcements that we were starting a little bit late. We were waiting for one or two people who were on the agenda and had roles and we also were trying to give Brett, Brett a chance to reconnect uh, since he was having camera problems. So I've, while we did start a little bit late, apologize for that. We did it for good reason and, inten and intent. I really liked the theme tonight. I thought the theme tonight was interesting and the comments that, uh, the comments and the questions, but survey, survey style wise with raised hands, I thought that, that Rob asked, I thought they were very good ones, especially comments about seeing a PA versus a doctor and, and the time that you get there. Partially because that's one of the ones that I'm really sensitive to these days when, when I have a doctor who is the other, who is strictly 100%, the, the other person only is the receptionist. That's the only other person she's got in the office. I thought for what we had as a topic, the word of the day was perfect for it. Advocate or advocate, either one, either noun or verb, I thought both fit perfectly, even though somebody didn't use it, that would be me. With regard to, let's see, we, get, we did get the, an introduction to the guest. Uh, behind the scenes, I was uh, probing and poking on Rob just a little bit as Toastmaster to make sure that when he got through, that uh, since Brett had made it back in, that he would remember to introduce the, the guest, and he picked up on that, and so that's really good. If you happen to be speaking, and occasionally just look down and see if you do get a chat, because sometimes your meeting facilitator may be bouncing one at you or somebody else. Uh, two prepared speeches. Always love having more than one speech so that we actually have a competition. And we've been doing a really good job recently of having two or three speeches at every meeting. Table topics. I thought that the questions for table topics, they were really good questions. They really were questions that anyone could answer. And I have to admit, I was a little bit surprised that they were as poignant for everybody as they were. I would have thought that some of them would have ended up being, a, you know, a, I haven't had to do that or something of that nature, but apparently all of us have been through similar experiences during the past few months. And I was a little bit surprised at the commonality of that. When you're doing a table topics, you really want questions that anybody can answer and finding something that everybody has in common can be really a challenge. I thought you did an excellent job with that. Uh, the evaluators, I enjoyed both evaluations. I thought they were on point in, in both cases and appreciated those. And I think that's really about all I have to say with regard to that. I am gonna do one completely off topic PSA. There was a portion of the meeting during which I left everybody in gallery view. And the reason that I did that, particularly given tonight's topic is called stop touching your face. 
and the people that I'm going to give a, a touching your face counter to people. Mark Sims, you are the highest at about seven times that you touched your face. I got caught, I caught myself twice, which indicates something about self-awareness because I actually even noticed that I did it twice. Marsha three, Nicholas three, Tanya, Dawn, and John, one each. And that's all I saw. Hindu, of course, had hers as a photo most of the time, except when she was actually speaking. So she is at a zero. Well done, Hindu. And so that's the PSA for tonight. Just, just remember, stop touching your face. And that from, can, will conclude everything for me, except for calling for a vote for the best of the big three. The big three being our Toastmaster of the evening, Rob Giles, our Table Topics Master, Nicholas Elwood, or myself as General Evaluator, Mark Schroeder, if you would. Same thing, go to Karen Lee, private chat, either Rob Giles, Nicholas Elwood for Table Topics, or myself as General Evaluator, Mark Schroeder. Give everybody just a moment to do that. Rob, do you have any comments that you want to finish up as Toastmaster? Uh, there was one thing that I, I wanted to kind of maybe test the waters for everybody. So today I actually had a doctor's appointment and it, it wasn't with my, my, my doctor, it was with the NP. And I've seen her though, probably more often than I've seen him over the past few years. Now, I don't want to start that but I go into the office and I start checking in and the person who's checking me in says, we need to check your temperature. And, you know, you have to have the mask on and all of this great stuff. And, you know, does the, the forehead temperature, great. I go sit down and then when I come in, I get my vitals done. The person who my vitals says, no, we can't use that we have to use an oral thermometer. So let me ask everybody here, would you proceed with that oral thermometer or would you refuse that? How, would, how many would refuse it? Well, to be honest, most places that I know that use oral thermometers also use a sleeve over it. So the sleeve goes in yes. and across it. Yes, true. However, you have to understand now, and I'm not saying it, I actually, I ended up you know, allowing them to do that. However, after thinking about it, I'm like, well, that the hand is closer to my mouth. The actual thermometer is closer to my mouth. You know, I have the mask off entirely. So I'm, I'm breathing and whatever's going on. Now, there was, there, there might have been one other patient there. And it was pretty much empty. So there was more, definitely more people working there than there were patients at the time. So, I mean, I was fine with it, but it was an interesting thing when I started to think about it. I was going, you just, you, you just did the right thing with the forehead thing. Now you're doing this, which really, yeah, you do have a covering for the thermometer, but you know, is, is that enough? Maybe not enough for everybody. John, you have something to say? Yeah, viruses can't jump. Anyway. Oh, can't. <laughs> I thought they were like tick. No. They can travel through the air and your saliva and your cough. But they can't I'm just saying, just yeah, <laughs> if I said jump, yeah, that was a, a <laughs> metaphorical term. Oh, you didn't say jump, I didn't. Oh, okay. Because it was better than my other thing, it's better than rectal, but go ahead. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, that was what I was always wor also worried about. I was like, wait, where was this before I... <laughs> okay. That's it, Mark. Yeah, I think I think I probably I have to admit I think I probably would have allowed it, only because it was for an extremely short amount of time. Uh, we, you're, you're not just talking about getting one instance of the virus; you've got to get a viral load, and so I think it's you're, you're probably exposed for a short enough period of time. It would be unlikely that you would get a high enough load to get you sick. That would be my my guess. I would let's if put I'm it this not, way: I would rather do that than sit in a mask for eight hours a day in an office. If I'm not here next week, you know why. Uh, yeah, also true. <laughs> All right, I guess at this point, if, they, if you don't have anything else as Toastmaster, we will turn it over to Lee King to begin our business meeting. Lee. All right, well, this is the business portion of the meeting. I always like to start with guests. So Brent, will you please share with us how you found us and what you thought about tonight's meeting? 
Yeah, thank you. I um I had originally found I I learned about Toastmasters a long time ago when I was doing high school uh, speaking. I did SFA uh, public speaking and then I did UIL public speaking, and I had heard about it back then. I went through college and uh, after now being out of college and in my career field, um, I kind of miss doing this kind of stuff. Um, I do run meetings and I do things like that, but this was a itch that I was kind of ready to scratch again. And uh, I had looked up online, the one that's in my local area. I actually live on Marquita Avenue uh, in the M Street. So this was a really close one. And also it seemed fun, the social uh, uh, Toastmasters group. So that being said, that's how I found you guys online. But this has been an organization that I've known about for quite a while. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I do hope that you'll come back and join us virtually and in person again. I don't really have a whole lot to share this evening. We will continue to meet virtually at least through this month, but probably through July too, considering that the COVID cases are going up, not going down. We're hitting some record highs, so I suspect it will be virtual for, for quite some time. But other than that, I really don't have anything else. We will have some virtual TLIs coming up. There'll be virtual, a virtual spring conference in the upcoming week. I believe it starts next Friday. Starts, tom starts tomorrow. Oh, I'm sorry, it starts tomorrow. So I think the district will be sending out a Zoom link and you can hop on and join the fun at whatever point you want to. It's like a marathon, I think, because they start to start speech a thons tomorrow night and they run all the way through. And then in between things are you know, area governor reports and there are some other things that will happen during that 24 hours, but just go online to the district website, you know, and I believe Rob emailed out the event. So just look at the schedule and see if there's anything that you'd be interested in joining in. Um, and other than that, I really don't have any other announcements. Does anybody else have anything? Lee, I do have a question on that. Yes. Is that is some of that information that I can forward out to some of our recent guests as well. I sure. Assume, I should be able to, right? They should be able to participate. Yeah, I don't think you it have requires, to be a member. It requires a registration. I don't know if that would prohibit them or not, but I don't know if there's, maybe we can test it out, maybe test that out, <laughs> go to that link, see if you can check. register okay. with a fake name or something and see if that works, if it does. Or Indu, do you know, is is it available to just anyone or do they have to be registered as a member for the while this weekend? For the conference that is on Saturday? Yeah, it starts like the speakathon, and then they it's, they went and changed it from speakathon to speakathon. But it starts that starts tomorrow at seven or seven thirty p.m. and goes all the way to seven a.m. Yeah, uh, um, I think you have to be um, registered or, or have a member that um, is registered um, because I think um, it, recently one of the meetings had a. Um, a cyber attack on when they were going forward with the meeting. I'm not sure if you read about it, but um, it was shared on the D50 group. So right now they are, they're not sharing the meeting ID and password with like, like how we used to do it before, like on flyers and things like that. So um, I can actually check with Monica and get you more details about that and you can share it with the group. Okay, yeah, I appreciate that just to know if we could I'm thinking in particular of people who are, are you know, that, that are already on our guest list. So we kind of know that they already have an interest. It's not like a public web page. I would not put it on the Facebook group, for instance. All right. Does anybody else have anything? All right. Well, let's hear from our vote counter who won. Um, let's see, Lee, we have for best uh, speaker, Don Levy. For best table topics, Marsha Collin. Uh, for best evaluator, Indu. And for best of the big three, Nicholas. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, everybody.
Thank you. All right. Well, thanks everybody for coming and have a good week. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, everyone. Recording in three, two, one.